Hi, my name is Jason Nikoff, and I'm an associate professor at Tennessee State University. Today, in this video, I'm going to be talking about drone laws and regulations. So to start out with, um, if you're flying a drone and it's for commercial purposes or educational purposes, you need to be certified uh, according to the FAA if the drone is anywhere between 0.55 pounds and 55 pounds. This is part of the uh, Part 107 uh, regulations. And so in order to do this, you have to pass a 60 question multiple choice exam that you can take at an FAA testing center. And then if you receive a 70% or higher, then you uh, can get certified. Now, technically under the FAA guidelines, even a farmer would need to be certified if they're using the drone for any sort of purposes where they're maybe flying over their, their land and uh, assessing things or making business decisions based on what they're seeing with the drone. So some basic regulations uh, with using a drone, you can only fly during daylight hours. And so this includes 30 minutes before official sunrise and 30 minutes after official sunset if your drone is equipped with anti-collision lights that can be seen for three miles. So if you don't happen to have these lights, um, then, you know, anytime between sunrise and sunset, you can, you can still fly without any issues. Another requirement is that you can only fly up to 400 feet, and this is uh, 400 feet above the ground or 400 feet above a structure. So whether it's a building or a grain bin or something else, uh, you can fly 400 feet above the top of that structure. You also have to have air traffic controller authorization whenever you're within five miles of a controlled airport. So these airspaces are classified as class B through class E. You have to maintain visual light line of sight with your aircraft. And so this means you have to be able to see it with your own two eyes. You can't use uh, binoculars. You can't use the, the screen um, that's, that's part of the, the controller with the drone. You have to be able to, to see it. Also, you can't fly over non-participating people. So anybody that's not involved in your activity, um, those would be considered the, the non-participating people. And then obviously you wanna stay clear and yield to any sort of manned aircraft. So whether this is a, a hot air balloon or a helicopter or a plane, uh, you always wanna yield the right of way to, to these individuals. And then also you have to have three miles of visibility. And so basically for this, we're talking about weather related conditions. So if you are, um, if there's a mist or a fog or something like that, um, you have to have three miles of visibility in order to fly under those conditions. Some other regulations, the maximum speed is 100 miles per hour or 87 knots. You uh, cannot fly a drone out of a moving vehicle unless it's in a sparsely populated area. You can carry an external load on the drone as long as it does not affect the flight or the controllability of the aircraft. And the drone with the cargo does not exceed 55 pounds. Also, you can't carry any sort of hazardous waste. You can't carry anything across state lines. And in Hawaii or DC or a US territory, you can't fly uh, with a cargo unless you have a waiver. So that gets us into waivers. So with waivers, you can request, um, you can request these for most of the regulations. Um, so basically, if for whatever reason you, uh, you need to fly at night, you can request a waiver. And when you're making these requests, uh, these are all done online. There's, uh, there's a website that's available um, where you can place a waiver. And, uh, and then when you file the waiver, you want to identify how you can make the, the flight as safe as possible, even though you are you know, not 
following um, all the regulations. So for instance, if you wanted to fly at night, maybe you would say uh, how you were going to include multiple people, multiple visual observers. Uh, maybe you would scout the area out during the daytime to identify any sort of obstacles. Maybe you would restrict um, the, the height that you're going to be going to, you know, well below 400 feet. Just some things that, that make the, the flight uh, safe, as safe as possible. So then inspections, uh, you need to do a pre-flight inspection before each flight. Basically, the pre-flight inspection, you can get some ideas from your, uh, a lot of times from the manufacturer of the drone. Um, but basically, this is just making sure that the propellers are working properly, um, the rotors are working properly if you're using a multi-rotor drone, uh, also that there's a good connection between the controller and the drone itself. And then also it's a good idea to keep logs, particularly if you make any sort of changes to the drone, if you have any sort of accidents or repairs, these are things you want to you wanna write down and, and and keep track of. If there's any sort of an injury with a drone that's a serious injury where somebody maybe loses consciousness or ends up in the hospital, uh, this is something, this accident has to be reported to the FAA within 10 days of the accident. Also the same thing goes for property damage caused by a drone. So if there's property damage in excess of $500, then you also have to report that to the FAA within that 10 day period. And then we also have, uh, the last thing is with registration. So with these drones, uh, again, if a drone is anywhere between that 0 0.55 pounds and 55 pounds, they have to be registered regardless of whether they're being used for commercial purposes or recreational purposes. And so this is something that can be done on the FAA website. There's a website called FAA Drone Zone and so you can apply for registration for your drone. It's $5 and it's good for three years. And so basically anybody who owns a drone, uh, they have to apply for this registration unless they are uh, 13 years old uh, or younger. Uh, then obviously a parent or guardian needs to uh, apply for that registration instead. Okay, uh, one other thing when we're talking about regulations and, and, and rules and, and safety, uh, these notices to airmen are important because they can help provide information uh, around your area as far as uh, some, some hazards that might be out there or um, any sort of, of new, um, new hazard that might be in the area that might affect your, your flying. And so you can uh, check these before your flight uh, by contacting flight service. There's the 1-800 number for that or else going online and essentially doing the same thing. These are uh, for these notices to airmen. And then I get a lot of questions about privacy, obviously, um, with drones. And so uh, basically, if you're flying a drone over private property, uh, then that can be considered criminal trespassing. So you know, be careful of that. Um, in, back in about five years ago, a, a guy in Kentucky shot down a drone that was hovering over his property and he was arrested for it, uh, but the judge dismissed the case. So in those situations, uh, it's, it's a good idea to just kind of let local law enforcement uh, uh, take control of the situation because uh, you can, you know, there's the one person who's offending um, or breaking the law by criminal trespassing, but then, you know, shooting down a drone is technically um, destruction of personal property. So you never know which way uh, the, the judge is going to side on some of those things. So just contacting local law enforcement, letting them know and, and letting them take care of the situation is, is the best idea. Now, when it comes to privacy with drones, there's also the concern that uh, with the drone, even though they're not on or they're not technically over somebody else's property, they can fly high enough where, you know, they can look into 
and see, you know, something that's going on, you know, in somebody else's property. So there have been a number of state laws that have been created to try to avoid uh, some of these issues. So in Tennessee, uh, in 2016, they had a, a law related to drones, and you can see the first portion up there uh, was specifically related to somebody uh, being able to capture images or conduct surveillance of uh, somebody else or their private property. So this doesn't mean that they're over the private property, but they're just taking pictures. So they're they're nearby um, and, and they're doing this kind of thing. So that's a law. So just, you know, just be uh, aware of that as well. Along with the law, there were some other things that were included uh, that you can see identified there about um, dropping things uh, into a, a venue uh, with, with more than 100 people, um, flying a drone, you know, in a fireworks uh, display, um, flying a drone over a correctional facility, um, any of those, you know, if you were, uh, if you were to, uh, you know, be um, convicted of those, those would come with a misdemeanor charge. The last one um, with this critical infrastructure facilities, these include things like um, your wastewater treatment facilities, your petroleum or chemical storage facilities, any sort of manufacturing plant or a uh, power generation or distribution station. Uh, these are all examples of critical infrastructure facilities. So you definitely wanna stay away from those. Um, any sort of conviction on, on that line is, is considered a felony. So that's why it's, it's important to be aware of some of these laws that are out there, whether it's a, a Tennessee law or whether it's a, a specific federal law. So that ends the, our, our video on uh, rules and regulations. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to contact me. My email uh, and my Twitter information are on the screen and uh, hope this was, uh, was helpful and uh, be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you.